In our previous work together, we've already touched on the idea of counting as a quantifying act, or basically an act of determining how much, how many. It's almost impossible to talk about counting without addressing this topic. But in this presentation, we're going to take a more focused look at the standard five under counting and cardinality domain. We're also going to take a look at some classroom routines associated with that and some example curricula. In kindergarten, we've already mentioned that children need many, many opportunities to answer how many questions. These questions fundamentally get at and reinforce children's understanding of cardinality, and they also serve as a breeding ground for beginning number relationships, which will be the foundation of arithmetic strategies. In Counting and Cardinality Standard 5, we see that children should count to answer how many questions, about as many as 20 things, and there's specific mention to being arranged in a line, a rectangular array, or a circle, or as many as 10 things in a scattered configuration. Given an, And then the last part, given a number from 1 to 20, they should be able to count out that many objects. So let's take a look at various elements of that standard, because there's quite a bit packed into that. Um, as we stated earlier, how many questions explore quantity? So it's important to mention that rote counting is not at all a focus of this standard. If any exercise is rote counting, there's other things that address that, but you cannot uh, align, I mean, it would be inappropriate to cite this particular standard for a, co a rote counting activity. So while you will want to provide some counting experience that goes beyond 20 in terms of being able to do rote counting, um, you really want to provide many experiences with numbers within 20 and using that to count real objects so that students are going to feel comfortable with those quantities. Also, as you look at the standard, you will see that there is a differentiation between the kinds of experiences students have when counting objects. They need to be able to count an existing set and they need to be able to do this with those items in various arrangements, so specific mention of the arrangements. They also need to be able to handle the more complex task of creating sets of given quantity. And finally, one last thing I want to say about arrangements is that you'll notice that while they're meant to work with objects, with arrangements for up to 20, there is a specification that in scattered configurations, just up to 10. And that is an indicator of the difficulty of, of scattered arrangements, even for adults. Uh, we would find it difficult to count scattered arrangements greater than that. In earlier modules, we have discussed the need for kindergarten children to have multiple opportunities to count real things. Some of the more common ways to do this include leveraging all of your daily routines, like attendance and snack time, or the the uh, routine of replenishing your supply stations. There are several articles on kindergarten classrooms doing inventory of their classroom supplies or bringing in collections or goodie bags of items to count. I imagine there will be quite a bit of idea sharing in the discussion board regarding the ideas that you are already implementing in your own classrooms to fit in the extensive counting experience that is required. We're going to take a look at, at each of these and you might have some of your own ways of doing them. Possibly you um, have some really great ideas to share in the, ten in the discussion board. Feel free to do that. These are not meant to necessarily replace what you're doing, but if you are looking for some, uh, something different, um, they provide an option and also the other ideas you learn from your peers could be an option. Attendance itself is a routine that lends itself to a counting experience. I encourage you to consider how you might set up the attendance procedure so that particular groupings are evident. While many children in kindergarten will be counting by ones as their primary go-to strategy, others might be beginning to think about groups of five and leftovers and, and how they can use those groups of five to count more efficiently. Those individuals who are having trouble using groups of five can still notice that you get the same answer. So even if a child uh, counts by ones, if they're in a classroom where another classmate shares how they counted by groups of fives and leftovers, um, it's beneficial to that person who's counting by ones, even if they're not quite ready for it yet, to try to follow. And at the very least, even if they struggle to follow the strategy, they see that that person got the same answer that they did. So they begin to recognize that it is actually possible to count in multiple ways and get the same answer. 
the idea that attendance happens every day and they get repeated opportunities to see these alternative ways of counting is also useful. It gives them time to make sense of this idea through repeated exposure before they're ever required to use it in a high stakes graded kind of an assignment. Snack time lends itself to estimation. About how many snacks do you think we're going to need today? What makes you think so? The kind of discussion that you can have around their reasoning will address mathematical standards of practice, and it also builds the idea that math is a study of reasoning and justification, not the study of wild guesses. After this discussion, children can then test their estimations and find out if their reasoning worked or not. If your classroom is set up with table stations that have supplies for each table cluster, then you can consider having the last few minutes of the day be a time to tidy up and replenish supplies. For example, you might have a caddy of supplies at one student table cluster, and there can be a little inventory the students use to replenish it. Perhaps the inventory for the caddy says that it should have six sharpened pencils and four scissors. If there are only four pencils, the student must figure out how many more pencils must I add to the caddy in order for it to have the correct amount listed on the inventory. So that's an example of a task that lends itself to some really rich mathematical questioning. Several articles and books published recently include stories of the big ideas that children learn while doing inventory in their classroom. Two examples included in the references section include Andrew and Trafton's Little Kids, Powerful Problem Solvers, Math Stories from a Kindergarten Classroom, and Fosno and Dolk's book Young Mathematicians at Work, Constructing Number Sense, Addition, and Subtraction. Those advantages to doing inventory include the opportunity for natural differentiation because you can have different learners working on different sized sets and they can um, have the benefit of using groupings to their advantage. So children working with very large numbers are unlikely to be able to do that effectively counting by ones, but they can start to use groupings of five or ten to their advantage. I remember once doing an inventory of books with a small group of learners, and the number of books began to get too large for easy counting. So we kept forgetting where we were in the count. Now, obviously, I knew that I wanted them to start thinking about groupings, so I kind of hammed it up a little bit. Oh, my goodness, this is really difficult. I keep forgetting where I am. What could we do? And so we decided. Um, to put them in piles. What kind of piles? What, can we, what kind of numbers do we know that we could count by? And so they thought about putting them in piles of 10, and I was able to ask, why would 10 be a good number? And they actually knew, because we can skip count by 10s. So the task itself fostered the idea of how to leverage this more rote skill, skip counting by 10s, in a counting task. One of the lesson links for uh, this particular lesson is entitled Goodie Bags. It is one of several lesson ideas that I've seen in which children bring, bring bags of items that they have collected, such as 15 twisty ties or 23 paper clips, and put them in a bag to be counted. The collections that children explore give them the opportunity to count movable objects and develop strategies for keeping track of the counts of movable objects. Sometimes little organizers are used, such as egg cartons. I encourage you to cut your egg cartons so that they are actually two rows of five rather than two rows of six, because essentially this will add further reinforcement of the idea of groupings of five and ten. Counting collections is especially useful for reinforcing an important connection discussed earlier in this module called the number triad. When students count a collection, they must name the quantity of the overall collection and bring together the quantity itself with its number name and the written numeral. Kathy Richardson's book, indicated in the reference section, is an excellent source of ideas for this. If students are capable of writing numerals, they can write them on a post-it and stick it to the collection. If they struggle with writing the numerals, you might have them just match numeral cards to the collection. Now we shift our attention to counting displays of objects rather than movable objects. As students experience counting opportunities, remember that the standard specifies that children learn to count increasingly difficult arrangements. It will be important for you to scaffold a process rather than just jumping right to scattered configurations. 
I'm reviewing this here, even though you had it in a previous presentation, because we are about to look at how this sequence might play out in a curriculum. So it's good to have it fresh in our minds. When children count by ones, usually a linear approach is easier because it requires little organization or planning to count. The child will simply point to the object, typically starting at the left and moving the finger to the right, counting each one. Rectangular arrays will be slightly more difficult for the child who counts by ones, but children who are ready, readily able to see groupings might find them actually a little easier. For example, if you see the image above is two rows of four, and you already know that four and four make eight, then you'll probably find the rectangular array easier to count than a linear arrangement of eight. Circular arrangements are challenging because you have to have a plan. You have to think about where you're going to start, and then you need to know how not to forget where you started by the time you get around the circle. So your purpose here in your plan is to prevent you from double tagging any dots, but counting each of the dots once. Finally, a scattered configuration is the most challenging. To be successful, children will often need to use their capacity to conceptually subitize, as discussed in a previous presentation. The, image that I'm the images, this one and the subsequent ones, all come from the Singapore Early Bird Kindergarten Mathematics books, and they occur early in the second semester of kindergarten. After you've looked at this, I encourage you to examine the sequence of images in your curriculum. Do you see any evidence that the displays are varied and that there is a type of sequencing that gradually increases the difficulty? These images actually come from one of my daughter's books, and the kindergarten books are consumable, so you actually can even see some of her handwriting in these books. Notice that the first image on this page is linear. The penguins are, or sorry, the penguins are linear. The bears, though, are in a rectangular array with one leftover. The dinosaurs are just a bit scattered, so they represent the challenge on this page. If you notice the counting box at the bottom of the page, this is something that the children are encouraged to use for the beginning part of this lesson. The beginning part is not the page. The beginning part is typically concrete. So the children used a counting box in the concrete part of the lesson before they started on the book. If some learners struggle to count the dinosaurs, you can ask them what they could try. Some may want to cross out the dinosaurs as they count them. Others may want to cover each dinosaur with a counting chip and then use the counting box to count the chips. The top images here use rectangular arrays, so in some ways they seem easier than the previous page. But look at the instructions here. They are to partition and just choose a portion of the larger set. So they have to essentially create a set from a set. So the child is asked to partition the items within uh, the, that will create a group of 10. You can see in my daughter's work here that she especially found this difficult in the circular and the scattered arrangements. She ended up using a yellow marker to show which ones were not in the group of 10 because you can see that she struggled to, to get that communicated. Notice that this exercise was more difficult because it did not merely involve counting the items, but it involved essentially creating a, a set, partitioning off a set that was of a given quantity. Creating a set of given size is more difficult for children than just counting a set that is provided to them. The image th that is shown here indicates how the groundwork from the previous lesson leads into another idea that we've discussed in this PD module, and that is the need for kindergarten children to make sense of teen numbers as tens and leftovers. And this will connect the counting and cardinality standard 5 with the number and base 10 standard 1. So we still have partitioning arrays, and we still have partitioning arrays into uh, a group of 10. But now we're also attending to that leftover, and we're writing them down, 10 and 3, 10 and 2, still not recording it as the overall number yet. But that's leading into that as an opportunity. The quote at the top, written by the Common Core authors, reminds us of the difficulty that students experience when they have to create sets of a given size. I encourage you to both recognize the added complexity of creating sets of specified, specified sizes while also emphasizing the need for opportunities for children to create such sets. So it's hard 
and we're still going to do it. <laughs> so the role of the teacher is to provide many opportunities for children to count objects and to ensure that the students get opportunities with counting movable objects, putting that quantity together within a number triad. They also need to count different arrangement of objects with gradual increase in complexity